Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Bad Lab Live. Today is not an ordinary episode of uh, these conversations that we have with uh, leaders in various fields. Uh, today I'm super privileged and very excited to welcome to the Bad Lab Live uh, Mamta Murthy. Mamta is the Vice President for Human Capital uh, at the World Bank. Uh, the vice president level is one of the key leadership roles at the World Bank and human capital is maybe the most interesting, most complex and most challenging element of the wider spectrum of human development, uh, especially in the world that we live in today. So without a much longer introduction, thank you for doing this with us, Mamta, and welcome to Pakistan. Is this your first trip to Pakistan? Thank you, Musharraf. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. And yes, it's my first visit uh, to Pakistan. And how are you finding it so far? Are you feeling welcomed? Are you feeling uh, lost? Are you feeling like this place is familiar, alien? I'm always fascinated by, uh, by people you know, of Indian origin or Indians that, that visit Pakistan because we don't really get to visit each other's countries that much. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, in part because the welcome has been so terrific. Uh, um, uh, Karachi is my first stop. I'm, I'm going to Islamabad next. Um, uh, my uh, mother's family have very happy memories of, uh, uh, and my mother herself has a very happy memory of go growing up in Karachi uh, during the war and the independence struggle. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, I am almost overwhelmed. It's both a professional and a personal joy for me to be here. That's, that's so great to hear. And of course, we have something in common on that front. Uh, both my parents were born in India. Uh, and my mother was in her teens when, when she moved here. Her memory uh, of her childhood also uh, warm and, hmm. uh, and fond and, and very different from the kind of the newspaper headlines that drive public discourse. Sometimes uh, headlines and discourse to which I contribute, not always in a positive way. Uh, but that's for another day. The, the visit uh, that you're here on, part of it is to talk about uh, human capital, uh, not just globally, but in Pakistan. And I was really fascinated that the bank is investing in this conversation at this time, because it seems to me that this is, might be the worst time to be talking about this. When we talk to governments, we know what the situation here in Pakistan is, but this is not a unique case. Governments all over the world are really struggling with whether or not they're capable of spending the kind of money and making the kind of longer-term investments that human capital requires. Uh, what are you finding at the bank? Are, are governments uh, sort of uh, constrained by the overall fiscal and, and monetary sort of shrinkage or, or constraints uh, of the times? So without a doubt, Musharraf, this is a difficult time, right? COVID-19 was a terrible worldwide shock and uh, uh, developing and emerging economies, which the World Bank focuses on, um, are only just recovering from this terrible shock. And then even as they were recovering, uh, you had the conflict in Ukraine, you have uh, food and fuel price escalation, uh, you have uh, adverse debt dynamics. Um, so without a doubt, this is a difficult time for developing countries. And the Sustainable Development Goals uh, um, uh, have experienced a setback. In fact, at the World Bank, we have estimated that the number of people globally in absolute poverty has gone up by 70 to 100 million people. So there, there were around 600 million people in extreme poverty before COVID, and post-COVID, that's gone up by 70 to 100 million people, so to around 700 million people plus. Um, now, governments are acutely aware in, in, in uh, uh, our view, and this was uh, reinforced by the spring meetings of the World Bank and the IMF, which just concluded. Uh, governments are acutely aware that they need to keep a focus on the long-term engines of growth, of which human capital is one. So from their perspective, they are trying to um, raise resources, but also prioritize those investments that have high rates of return, and plus, they're looking for, for external support. Um, and on the World Bank side, we are trying to advocate for human capital and make sure that it remains a priority in public spending, but also advise uh, on the kinds of investments which have a high return, um, how to 
spend more effectively. And we're also a very large financier of uh, health and education and social protection. So we're also coming forward with, with financial support. There's two kinds of contests that emerge from that, uh, Mamta, that I want to explore a little bit. The first is maybe, I don't know how keen you are to have this discussion, but the first is within the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, I mean, there was a time when the bank was one of the key sources of infrastructure financing the world over, including in places like Pakistan. Even today, there are important infrastructure uh, efforts that, that, that the bank and, and, and other partner organizations like the Asian Development Bank support. Um, and... I suspect governments are always keen for the quick wins of infrastructure, which you can see in a year and a half, two years, and which you can point to. Uh, infrastructure is just one example, but more broadly, how much of an internal sort of uh, tension is there with it, within an organization like the bank between the longer term investments in health, in maternal and neonatal care, in education, in skills, versus kind of the harder infrastructure and, and the kind of quicker wins that may be within the bank, but also in, in your partner countries where there may, may be more urgency or prioritization? Um, so within the bank, I think there has been a recognition for a long time that uh, uh, countries need to take a balanced approach to development. It can't only be about physical capital. It can't only be about human capital sure. either, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that recognition has been there for some time. But in 2018, we started something called the Human Capital Project. Which you're, which you're leading. Indeed. Yeah. Which um, uh, helps make the case uh, uh, by doing analysis, by collecting data, by um, helping countries learn from each other about what works and what does not work in the area of human capital. So I would say that um, with the Human Capital Project, we have firmly branded, if you like, the importance of, of human capital in a country's development trajectory. And the country that best comes to my mind in this context is Morocco. Okay. I, was in, I was in Morocco at the end of last year, and I was really struck by the fact that their national development strategy explicitly talks about the need to shift from physical capital, where they have made heavy investments, towards a more balanced approach which emphasizes human capital. So I, I think that there is a recognition, uh, I just give this as an example, but there are many countries where there's this recognition that it's very hard to ma make progress, become a middle-income country if you're low-income, and become a high-income country if you're middle-income without these human capital investments. Now, you talked about something very important. You said uh, infrastructure might give you a quick win, and uh, you can cut some ribbons, and it's very attractive, whereas human capital gives you wins over the long term. I would say that infrastructure actually takes a very long time <laughs> to deliver returns, especially big projects mm -hmm. take a long time to prepare, to procure, to, to you know, get to the conclusion and to yield the benefits. Whereas uh, human capital, we've seen lots of countries that have been able to do things like reduce stunting or um, improve uh, learning outcomes, or, uh, or at least improve attendance in mm -hmm. school by teachers and students. In, in short periods of in time. In short periods of time. So I would say that um, actually it's a, it's a, there, are, there can be quick wins, provided there's political leadership and uh, administrative ability to deliver. It can be a quick win, and it's very popular with uh, the electorate. I, I, I... I'm so happy that, you, that you've said this because this traditional or conventional wisdom about human capital being a longer term sort of play and, mm. uh, sorry, human capital taking longer to, to kind of, you know, uh, manifest the benefits of those investments, whereas infrastructure being quicker or more visible. I think that challenge that you've posed is interesting. How do you find sort of governments in terms of their responses to this, to this proposition? Because I'm, I suspect the conventional wisdom I've cited is, is common in other places that you end up being in and talking to. Um, so we find that governments are very interested in examples. Mm. Examples of other countries that may have achieved some of the outcomes that they are targeting. Yeah. And so a lot of what we do is help countries talk to each other and, and have you know, knowledge exchanges. Now, every country is different. So yeah. Uh, Indonesia is a very good example of a country that has made huge progress in improving um, uh, nutrition at the early ages and has reduced stunting. 
Um, so we've uh, been working with Indonesia to share that experience with, with other countries. And then uh, other countries look at it and say, hmm, uh, could we do exactly this or do we have to tweak it, et cetera. So um, we find that bringing examples and helping countries talk to each other is very, very helpful. I suspect that the most successful examples of those countries that learn from other countries are the ones that learn the kind of outcome level and purpose level lessons rather than the specific models and paradigms. Indeed. Because, because Lant Pritchett talks about yes. this, this notion of isomorphic mimicry, uh, that too many countries that are developing see the success of other places. And I think his reference is more West versus non-West, but I think that's increasingly, for a country like Pakistan, for example, now the conversation, especially in the last three or four years, has really become focused on Bangladesh, India, and of course, Southeast Asia for a long time, but Bangladesh and India. I think part of it is just the similarities and commonalities that we have with these countries. But again, I think each country's contexts are different. So if we try and replicate what's happened in those countries, are we likely to have the kinds of benefits that we're seeking? It's exactly as you put it. I think uh, it's very important to understand how the country went about achieving the outcome and then ask oneself, what is the lesson here? Yeah. And how does that lesson translate into my own country? Um, since we're talking about nutrition, I think one of the things we've noticed, whether it's Indonesia or Morocco, is um, leadership. Uh, from the highest level is extremely important for things like nutrition, which are multi-sector, right? You need family planning. Uh, you know, if you space births, you yeah. have healthier children, healthier mothers and healthier children. Um, you need access to vaccination at the right time. You need access to health services uh, for, for kids. You need advice to parents, mothers and fathers on how to, how to feed their kids. And you need monitoring, right, of, of whether the, the child is developing well. And all of this requires health services, family planning services, education services, uh, parental outreach to all come together. And it's hard to achieve. That's why leadership from the highest level, which is sort of sending the message, and then administrative capacity at the lowest level becomes so important. And every country has done this differently. Absolutely. Part of this conversation makes somebody like me a little bit anxious and, and really uh, nervous because, I mean, you mentioned nutrition, and I think it's such a brilliant example, partly because of the massive price escalation over the last, uh, food, you know, 12 yeah. to 18 mm -hmm. months. I think... You know, you didn't mention climate change, which is central, I think, to oh. food security, agricultural research, oh. extension, agricultural services, uh, technology. You know, there's a whole range. So as we keep adding on these different verticals and we think about, OK, to get nutrition right, to reduce, to dramatically reduce stunting and wasting in Pakistan, which I think is an absolutely central element of human capital formation for this country. We're going to have to bring together so many different ministries at so many different levels, na uh, federal, uh, mm -hmm. or what you know in India, what you call union, union. yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, provincial, which is in India the state, and then local, the panchayat level. At all three levels, we have dysfunctions, we have resource constraints, we have conflicts, political and and technocratic, that make it very difficult to conceive of the the realism or the or the the plausibility of everything coming together. When you are con when you face this kind of a situation, I'm sure Pakistan is not unique. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little yeah. bit about how countries overcome this kind of nervousness about multi-sector sort of coordination and coherence. Um, so the different levels is a complexity in every country, right? Um, because typically it's local governments that have to handle nutrition. Um, I think the big insight that we have at the World Bank, which we have really learned from governments that have done this, is um, don't try and do everything at once, right? It is daunting if you have to address every issue that is relevant to nutrition outcomes. And, you know, the long journey begins with the first step. So start with the first step and then build, do the second, do the third, do the fourth. So it's a cumulative thing. Now, um, many countries have started with... Uh, in addressing nutrition have started with mothers and children and health services. That's where they start because that's absolutely fundamental. Well, that's right? where life starts. Yeah, okay, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then they add on the family planning bit. And then they, they think about child, uh, child nutrition, both in preschool and in school. 
And then they think, okay, how do we get nutritious foods into school? How do we link to the agriculture in the country, right? How, and how do we make that agriculture more sustainable? So it, if you like, it's like a, it's like something that grows outwards, Concentric right? Concentric rings. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that's what makes the, the challenge more manageable. And then you've got to kind of learn along the way. You're going to make some mistakes. Uh, but for something that's really important, you know, you, you have to have bureaucratic tolerance for something that is not working and, yeah. and may fail. So having, having an atmosphere where, where you can do that and experiment a little bit also, also makes a difference. You know the expression, don't bite off more than you can chew? Yeah. I think that really works for making, uh, for making changes, uh, making dents in some of these indicators. But do you worry sometimes that that warning yeah. will, will prompt leaders to automatically lower their level of ambition. So, I mean, to give yeah. you an example, female labor force participation in Pakistan, it's, a, it's not a great story. It's at 23%. Now, I was looking at the data, and actually, it was 11% in 1990. So, if I want to encourage somebody, what I would say to them is, listen, last 30 years, you doubled it. Next three years, can we think about doubling it? Maybe that's too much. Okay, hmm. next six years, hmm. can we double it? But basically, we want leaders to have really big ambition where the numbers are just so poor, right? Like South Asia is a laggard in female labor force participation across the board. But Pakistan is especially behind the curve on this. Where do, what's the right balance between ambition and, and not, hmm. not forcing or... or yeah. encouraging governments to bite off more than they, than they can choose. So in an electoral system, right, yeah. Yeah, in democracies, uh, as we have in South Asia, you want to promise something and you want to be seen to deliver, sure. right? Yeah. So I think it's great to have uh, very high, uh, set yourself very ambitious goals um, and then, you know, deliver some of that. But you, you're also making a promise to the electorate, right? Sure. So you you, it would be very hard to say I'm going to double it in three years, but you can say here are five big things I'm going to do, and I expect it will. It could lead to a doubling. So, I, the, but focus on what is it that you would specifically do, sure. because my sense is that it's very easy at the political level to <clears throat> have a goal, but then it really has to translate down into what each each part of society is doing. And that's the other thing I want to focus on because we've talk, talked a lot about government, but many of th these things are about government, but they're also about parents, they're about communities, they're about the corporate sector, the private sector. I mean, one of the things I'm struck by is that um, food labeling is uh, not up to the standard that it needs to be at. In our, uh, we have this, in, in addition to malnutrition and stunting and wasting, at the other end of the spectrum, we have growing obesity yes. in South Asia, especially yeah. in our and cities. Diabetes yeah. is like an yeah. epidemic. Yeah. So I think there's a lot that uh, the private sector can do if you think about things like food labeling, uh, uh, pr production of nutritious foods. Uh, um, so it's, it's a whole of society effort, so we shouldn't forget that aspect of things as well. Parents are hugely important. Yeah. And by the way, religious leaders and community leaders also play a role central. in this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had the opportunity to visit Brazil and they've done some amazing things at the local level in education. I mean, they've always been mm. a bit ahead of the curve, I think partly thanks to leaders like Paulo Freire and, and, and that tradition. Uh, but I was, I was really surprised at the centrality of the role of the church mm. in, in, in local communities uh, supporting and really driving the reform conversation. I think that's something we want to eventually see in this part of the world because I don't think people are going to abandon faith anytime Not soon. Not at all. It's and actually I don't think central, we should ask them to. Yeah, it's yeah. central to how they behave, exactly. right? So it's important to get the religious leaders on board. So at the World Bank, we've been quite excited by some of the work we've been doing with imams okay. in Africa. So we've worked uh, in Egypt, uh, in Ghana, in Niger, in Mauritania. And this is above the FGM agenda more broadly. This is about family planning. Okay. It's about domestic violence yeah. and FGM. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, family planning is the big one. I, I, it's, it's always struck me that it's so powerful to have an imam say, uh, you know, uh, how is this uh, fair treatment of yeah. all? If, if you have a situation where a woman has, a, you know, a child in one hand and a child in the belly and, and then a third one that she's holding by the hand, yeah. right? So when they say things like that, it's, it sends a very powerful message, which then the family planning services can, can, can use to actually provide uh, access to um, family planning. It's so encouraging to hear you talk about this because for years, I think, with, with at least my own experience, 
I, I found that the bank, I think quite rightly, seeks not to really get into more murky areas mm. that are that are more controversial. The one area that, that I still think the bank, and again, I think rightly, probably is choose, uh, but that I think I find unavoidable is kind of the politics with a small p. Is there any escaping that politics with a small p? Certainly, I mean, I think some of the best political analysis actually comes from people at the bank that, that look at governance issues. But more broadly, one of the things you said that struck me is I think as South Asians, we have a natural uh, proclivity towards democratic governance as, as the system. Uh, partly it might be the large size of the populations mm. and the need to make sure everybody is at least included. marginally on board and mm. included. But there's lots of countries that are doing really well that don't have democratic systems. How, does, how do you find the conversation between those countries and countries where there are either notionally or, or thorough democratic systems? What, what, like, how does it change the human capital conversation or the project that you're working on in terms of how you engage with those governments? Um, so let's think of family planning, right? Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that uh, um, countries have approached it very differently. Uh, there was the one-child policy in China, for yeah. example, um, and uh, uh, there hasn't been the one-child policy uh, anywhere else. Yeah. And what we've learned is that it actually caused a lot of trauma and, and unhappiness. And now, of course, China is at the other end of the demographic dividend yeah. and is extremely worried about the sharp decline in, in the workforce. So I think our effort, uh, just, le just keeping the focus on the family planning side, I think our, our effort has really be ar been around making the case that uh, there should be the access to services that allow uh, families to plan family size. And there shouldn't be the unmet want for contraception. Uh, so that, that's how we've steered that dialogue. And, you know, irrespective of the nature of, of government, they sort of understand uh, that we're talking about unmet need for, uh, for family planning. So and, it, you know, it, 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 uh, it's an effective strategy to yeah. use. And it's com complemented by a lot of survey data that, yeah. we, uh, that we collect and governments themselves connect. So, yeah. they correct, so they know about the unmet demand for family planning. I think the way that I would interpret that then is to say that one of the ways in which we overcome the kind of variation in, in governance systems is by focusing on the importance of agency for individuals and for families. It doesn't really matter what system of governance yeah. you have, every mm -hmm. human being deserves agency and I think that's yeah. really what human capital ultimately is, is really about enhancing. Indeed, and um, having data. I think is extremely helpful because we can all have different views about things, right? But sure. we can, if we agree that data should be collected on certain things, then we can look at this data yeah. together and sort of thrash out why we uh, are viewing the problem differently and, and what the solution might be. I'm so happy uh, that you're here in Pakistan and you're going to be talking about these issues in the way that you just did. Uh, I hope lots of people will pay attention to the substance of what you just said. There's some really, I think, rich insights in what you've just suggested. And I'm sure in your conversations with government, you'll be uh, as uh, or even more articulate. Um, <laughs> and I hope you'll be coming back to Pakistan frequently, inshallah. Indeed, I want to. I was, I'm not going to be able to get to Lahore uh, this time. And uh, it's a city that I've always wanted to see. So um, I'm, I'm going to make it uh, the priority for my next visit. See, people talk about uh, Karachi, uh, rightly so, and Islamabad, of course, which is my town, rightly so. And Lahore always makes it. But I would strongly recommend that the next time you're here, you also pay a visit to Quetta and to Peshawar. Uh, these, uh, especially Peshawar, I have a long-standing love affair with this city, uh, and, and and there's some really amazing things in human capital that have happened uh, in all the provinces, but especially in in, in the Peshawar? health uh, oh, okay. in the health sector in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Well, I want to eat Peshawari naan, which I have, <laughs> which we eat in India, but I I want to have it in the source. The re the real yeah, thing, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, you will find Peshawaris and and people in KP to be incredibly hospitable. And, and uh, they will take very good care of you uh, for when you visit next, uh, God willing. Thank you again for doing this. Thank you, Musharraf. It was a pleasure to talk to you. My, my pleasure to have you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue these conversations very soon. Thanks for joining us. Khuda Hafiz.